fan club ever. Yep. Would you like to start? Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, I can start today. Um, is a goal in Buddhism to eliminate negative emotions completely, or can they also be viewed as having important functions? <coughs> I think that yes, they do have important functions. Um, uh, maybe up to a stage in your spiritual development, because all these emotions you have and thoughts, etc. It can be a very clear signal that there's something we need to do externally, socially, physically to protect ourselves. So um, they do have important functions, yes. The thing is that after a while, um, those negative emotions they actually do cease. That's, that's actually the goal of the whole uh, spiritual teaching. At one point, the, they don't, they don't um, kind of arise anymore. But that doesn't mean that you stop protecting yourself. It doesn't mean that you cannot you destroy your body or you uh, don't react to social relations, which isn't kind of good or it is, which is unwholesome. It's just that you can walk through life without, you can walk um, skillfully through life without needing to. Um, become unskilly, unskillfully mentally. So you can be happy and joyful even though there are different things socially and physically and bodily. That's basically uh, what we're heading for. Uh. <laughs> That's definitely not for me. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. it's even in Norwegian. Good, <laughs> bad, uh, meaning like uh, may you be healthy quickly or something. Wishing you a speedy recovery. And I just want to say that uh, Bolle is now, uh, bodily health is back, mindful clarity is back. Uh, my voice is getting normal again. The only thing is left, and I'm doing some coughing, some dry coughing. So tomorrow, from tomorrow on, I'm probably normal again. So all good. Where do things go? Feelings go. Sensations go. Beings go. To this? When we let them go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> they don't go anywhere, they just go. <laughs> they just disappear. The causes have gone, so the results have gone. So, they don't go anywhere. I mean, feelings, moments, they live in your memory. I think that's the only place they really live. And even there, they're not really real. They're just memories of something. They're happening now as memories, right? So, uh, sensations also go to oblivion. And beings, who knows where they go? It depends on the karma they've created. So, if you've created good karma, you'll probably go either back to the human realm, or to the deva realm, or to the brahmaloka, if you've got into some nice meditation. Or, if you're really lucky, you might, uh, you might just completely disappear. But then it wouldn't be a problem because you wouldn't consider that you existed in the first place. So, um, uh, where we let them go? I don't know where they go when you let them go. I mean, if you're letting somebody in your life go, you're not going to really mind where they go. So, who knows? I don't know how else to answer that. They just disappear. Things disappear. And the disappearance is bliss. So said the Buddha. Um, here's a good proof that karma yoga works. That uh, all the chores, and there's a few chores we have here. I had cravings for mushroom, uh, mushroom soup. What is that? <laughs> and at dinner, <laughs> and at dinner, they arrived. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So he said, go, Karpan Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> but where did they go? <laughs> Into our stomach. <laughs> and then? <laughs> Mm. Eyes open or eyes closed during meditation? I know you could look around you and find out what other people are doing. So <laughs> it's a silly answer. Um, it's really up to you. Um, most people find eyes closed. I guess I shouldn't take two. I should be restrained. Um, <laughs> um, most people, well, at least myself, and I guess most people that I don't look at when I'm meditating, um, <laughs> prefer to have their eyes closed simply because it's one more sense to bring in more information to the mind. So when your eyes are closed, the world becomes quieter, at least the visual world, and then you have much less of the other senses as well as you um, deepen in the practice. So that can be uh, very helpful, and it's also very restful for the eyes and for the face, and you know it just seems to work. You sort of go into your inner cave, inner world, and you know it's nice when you and forget that other people are there and you also know if everyone else's eyes are closed that no one's looking at you which means you can pick your nose if you want <laughs> or whatever you can let your face relax you, know? you can even dribble <laughs> but if your mind is very restless it's true right I mean actually once in India when I was meditating I had a terrible cold much worse than Bantanita's cold sorry about it but it was really <laughs> severe and it lasted kind of the entire retreat and every morning it would just gosh from my nose and a couple of the teachers on the retreat said have you just let it go you know as in let it gosh <laughs> because you're blowing your nose all morning for two hours and I said oh yeah that's an idea they said just put a towel or something <laughs> so I, I did and it just streamed out it was amazing however I wasn't in a public meditation or I was in a little cell okay but it was amazing because it came right down the towel and beyond it was really fantastic so anyway <laughs> that's kind of helpful isn't it and after that, it cleared, actually, quite fast, because I was letting you be. So, you know, there's something very kind of deep in that, and I don't do that anymore. So that lasted for years, in the morning meditation. It would just stream. Anyway, too much information. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to close your eyes, uh, open your eyes. For some people, it kind of works, as long as there's no one next to you with a towel. Um, <laughs> but I think the purpose that some people find in keeping their eyes open it, it is maybe if their mind is very busy, if they're thinking a lot and if they're just really not in the present moment and then they could kind of gently lower the eyes, probably not wide open but you know, just lower them and, and look at one place, one spot and that can help with presence, it can help with being wakeful in the beginning I've tried it a little bit, very rarely but I find that after a while I want to close my eyes anyway, but if you do have say some kind of trauma coming up or some kind of heavy anxiety and it's just too kind of <coughs> scary to be inside then one way is to just open your eyes and remind yourself you know you're okay right now you're sitting you know you're grounded you still can see your hands like you're okay so anyway This is perhaps a stupid question. Um, that's probably a nice now. But what gets reborn or stays identical in reincarnation? Uh, reborn. Shouldn't we learn and even experience that there is? Shouldn't we learn even and even experience that there is no self? Okay. So two questions here. Um, what gets reborn, or stays, or stays identical in um, in the rebirth? Um, um, the one basic foundation in Buddhism that is that there isn't anything kind of stable or permanent, even while we're living, and that continues also when we go from one life cycle to another life cycle. It's just a continuation of an impermanent changing process. And I think there is this um, 
there's this simile in, in some kind of commentary, commentary or literature. It's like there, you have this, they have this candlelight burning, and it kind of burns down, 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 all the way till it's all, to, to, to it's kind of always uh, on the end. And then you take a new candlelight and you re you lit the next candlelight from the previous one. And then you have a new candlelight burning until that one is kind of always on the end. And you take a new one and lit the new one from the old ones. So there, like the fun, the idea in Buddhism, it, it, there isn't a soul or something which goes across. But there is a continuation of a process. And that continuation also includes like, um, I don't know, like experiences and memories. So one of the, one of the um, part of the training towards awakenings is actually to be able to remember your past lives. Who you were and where did you live and who, what did you do and etc. What, what was your name, etc. That's part of the training. So uh, basically, uh, nothing gets uh, kind of reborn. It's just a continuation of a process. But we are kind of we are, in Europe. Um, we are quite conditioned by Christianity, and we have taught what this idea of, of a permanent soul, and that is something which is kind of beyond this life thing. The Buddhist has another view of this. Uh, shouldn't we learn and even experience that there is no self? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's why we're doing this. Uh, this idea of non-self is something you're supposed to understand. It's something you're supposed to realize and experience and understand deeply. And that is uh, also the cause for first stage, first first stage of awakening, dream awakening. So, um, you should learn and experience that there is no self. And the result of that is uh, that um, uh, uh, the, this, this idea of no self basically uh, lessen suffering in your mind. There's more wisdom and there's less creation of mental suffering. In reality, you just get happier. Life is easier. Less problems. And the further you go, the higher stages of awakening, the less suffering we create for ourselves. So yes, we are supposed to learn and experience oneself. Can you recommend a book detailing the life of the Buddha? Yes, there's a very good book by I think Bhikkhu Jnana Moli called The Life of the Buddha, I think. And it's really cool because it's got different voices and um, different narrators. So there's like the first voice, which I think, I probably get it wrong because it's a long time, which I think is straight from the sutta. It might be Venerable Ananda, who was his uh, attendant for 45, 35, 45 years. And it has um, some kind of chanter, I think there's a chanter who brings out verses that were kind of slightly later. And uh, what else is there? There's a few different voices. It's very interesting. It's very alive. So it's talking about his life, but it's also um, including his teachings and including some of the, um, obviously, the people, the relationships, the situations that happened to him. So I would recommend that. Um, I would also recommend The Great Disciples of the Buddha, which is about his various disciples. Unfortunately, mostly weighted on the monks, because there's more literature about the monks, generally speaking, and a bit thin on the bhikkhunis. But still, there are some stories of bhikkhunis and lay women as well. And it's very inspiring because you realise that each and every fully awakened person has their own unique character and personality, even after full enlightenment. They're not just this kind of blank slate you know, that sort of goes through life, like not really feeling happy, not really feeling sad, like kind of do, like a robot. They're not. They're very unique and they all have different strengths and qualities, but all of them have in common that they've uprooted greed, hate, and delusion. So that's really inspiring and uh, relatable, I find, as well. 
maybe things were passed down by word for a long time. Did Siddhartha lead a wild time? Trying out all pleasures, yes. Quite a wild time. He had all these different palaces for different seasons and he had lots and lots of women in there, like kind of, what do you call it, when they're not your wife? <laughs> and, uh, and he had all the music and, you know, I'm sure he had lots of luxury, all the delicious food. It was kind of laid out on a platter for him because he was a son of a sort of small king, small kingdom, so a prince in a small kingdom. Why do you think he didn't want his aunt or mother to follow <laughs> the teaching and his companion had to persuade him, if that's true? Thanks. Doubtful that it's true, in my mind. There's a great talk by Bhante Sajato that covers this a little bit. It's called Bhikkhuni Ordination. And interestingly, it was given in August 2009, 2009 uh, before the Perth ordinations. So the Perth ordinations... Uh, happened in 2009 October and there were some sort of um, accusations towards Ajahn Brahm that he did it secretly but actually <laughs> there was no such secrecy at all because this had been in the making for a very long time and Bhante Sajato was talking about it, Ajahn Brahm had done interviews even for the Bangkok Post several years before that to talk about how it should happen, why it should happen, um, pretty public. And so, yeah, Bhante Sajato's idea is that it's probably not the case, and I think subsequently he's written books to um, sort of further that argument. There are also arguments that um, the rules laid down, the reason for his hesitation for his uh, maternal aunt was that she came from the Sakyan clan, which was a very proud kind of clan, and also the fact that she was his kind of um, foster mother. So he kind of worried that maybe she was too kind of tender for the lifestyle and also that um, she might get proud because she's, you know, got this special position to the Buddha in relation to the Buddha. So uh, he might have hesitated for that reason. Personally, I think the main reason could have been, if it's true, that uh, he was just concerned for their safety and he wanted to know that they'd be safe. So he had to sort of formulate certain... Um, um, safeguards to make sure that they would be protected because even today in India you wouldn't want to roam around as a woman on your own um, so that was clearly in his mind but actually there's other texts which are much more reliable that make it very clear that the Buddha's intention from the very beginning was to have a very strong fourfold assembly of bhikkhunis, fully ordained women bhikkhus, fully ordained men lay women, lay men and he actually said that he wouldn't pass away, he wouldn't attain Parinibbana until that fourfold assembly was strong, as in very well learned, very well experienced in the Dhamma, able to teach and fully enlightened, that there were areas in all those assemblies. And that was an umbrella term that was meant to include all people. You know, that was the way it was formulated then. Today you could include all genders, all, you know, all people basically, um, so that everybody feels represented. And there was no exclusion based on caste, based on, you know, caste had a relation to colour as well. And there was no exclusion based on that. He actually went as far as to um, ordain somebody from a lower caste or with a darker colour in a more so-called menial job that was looked down upon in society first before some of the higher caste people. So that the higher caste ones would have to pay respect to the other one. And um, yeah, so it was obvious that he was completely against caste. He was completely against um, any kind of discrimination based on external form. And he said time and time again, what makes one really a sort of high-minded person is the qualities in the heart, is the level of purification, the awakening, the insight that they have. So um, you have to read these paragraphs that seem a little bit strange and out of place in the context of the general message of the suttas and if you look for evidence to the contrary you'll find plenty so um, some of it could be myth and it certainly doesn't really help the bikini cause today to be honest because myths tend to get institutionalized and then there's no incentive from people who are against it to try to question those myths unfortunately nevertheless we continue yeah.
And I just want to um, underline, uh, to just um, emphasize what you said about this book, this early Buddhist name, the early disciples of the Buddha. Mm, great disciples of the Buddha. Yeah, yeah, great disciples of the Buddha. That's a really ex- uh, inspirational, uh, nice book to read. It's one of my favorite books. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> Ooh. If everything is, uh, if everything in experience is fabricated by the mind, um, does that mean we will live in our own private virtual world? <laughs> Biologically, <clears throat> uh, like a biological virtual reality that we can use to mo- model reality or hack to produce oceans of bliss. Can we escape from our virtual reality bubbles into the true nature? Or is experience um, necessarily virtual? Meaning that reality in itself is inaccessible. Forever (laughs) a mystery beneath the surface of our projected Reality models. This was very. Uh, um, <laughs> um, so I, you can start at the beginning. Is everything in experience uh, fabricated by the mind? Does that mean that we can live in our own private virtual world? Is everything in experience fabricated by the by the mind? No. Uh, at least we can say it's not fabricated by the mind. The mind. Um, the mind can actually fabricate things, but also the mind also gets input from our bodies, our senses. So what we perceive in our, our mind is both mental kind of inputs, processes, and physical stuff from our body. Um, so does it mean we can live in our private virtu- virtual world? Um, <laughs> Why do I have to get married? <laughs> <laughs> because you're the buddy server of the evening. <laughs> and I'm very grateful. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> the Buddha was very clear that, in one sense, that our mind is the foreigner. So it is, it, everything starts in our mind. So everything which is kind of created, everything we experience is kind of started by our mind somehow. I don't think we can live in our own private virtual world. But what we can, when, in, um, the, the only way we can do that is. Um, it, it, um, this is kind of using world from kind of words from the computer science, which doesn't kind of apply. <laughs> but um, the closest you can get is that there are stages of existence, like really deep stages, basically above the Eva world, which we call like a Rupa or Arupa world, Arupa realms. And these are realms which are pure mental. There's no physical body. Nor is there a fine material body, like a Deva body. So it's an existence which is mainly just extremely uplifting and full of energy and joy and happiness. But there's no sensory, um, uh, there's no senses, no bodies there. So in that sense you can say that you can live in your own private kind of um, virtual (laughs) world. I think that's the closest you can get. Can we escape our virtual bubbles into the reality, the true reality? And what what's then this true reality? Nibbana? So again, if, if I continue my, my kind of explanation, it actually is true. You can go from a really high type of... Um, 
kind of lifestyle which is extremely um, uplifting and on a higher level and from there go to uh, Nirvana. I think that's what uh, Anagama is doing. So if you get third level of awakening as a human being and then you die, your body dies, you will continue to a really, really high type of existence which is far up there in this Rupa, Rupa types of existence, which there's no body, where they have their last existence. And then from there, they will enter uh, Nirvana, Pari Nirvana. Um, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough. Okay. Ajahn Brown mentioned gratification, danger and escape. Good listening. Can you further explain it, please? Yeah, so usually this is um, a little um, kind of, what do you call that, like little uh, refrain that applies to the sensory world. And it's supposed to point to the fact that there is some pleasure to be found through the senses, right? There is some pleasure, otherwise we wouldn't be so attached to them, right? We wouldn't crave for pleasure at the level of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and also of the mind, right? Uh, but I think here it's really pointing to the pleasures of the senses. So there is some gratification, and uh, we can be honest to that, but we can also see that it's limited, so the danger is looking at the shortfalls and the likelihood of becoming attached, dependent, even addicted, um, and I would say of missing out on something much more sublime. So it's not only a danger in the sensual pleasures themselves, it's also a danger that you're getting stuck in that place and actually missing something much more beautiful and meaningful and profound. And the escape from those sensual pleasures is precisely the escape so to speak, into the pleasures of the mind, which mean the pleasures of meditation. And again, you know, that means anything up to, but especially jhana. Um, so anything in that direction that's leading towards jhana is the escape. So all those right intentions, the Eightfold Path, you can say, the whole Eightfold Path. Um, and there's another sutta, which Ajahn Brahm likes to talk about. Um, not sure what it's called, but uh, it's a sutta where... I think a Deva Putta comes to the Venerable Ananda. His a Deva Putta is like a being from the uh, Deva from the heavenly realms, and asks, I think Venerable Ananda, um, what is the escape? The Buddha taught the escape from basically suffering, right, from this world. What is that escape? What is the okasa, which means like the um, hole, the tunnel that goes out? And um, the answer was the four jhanas. So that's like a kind of tunnel that um, takes you into the realm of the mind and shows you what the real danger of sensuality is and how limited that gratification is. So the escape becomes not a running away, as we've said, it's a making peace, being kind, being gentle, letting go, making peace with whatever arises, that's the root. But it leads to this freedom, it leads to um, coming out of a prison, the prison cell of these five senses. So in that sense, you escaped. And that's temporary at first, but eventually um, it's complete escape from the whole round of existence. <laughs> What's with the stuffed animals? <laughs> <laughs> that means you haven't tried it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, may all beings, stuffed or otherwise, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was in Australia when this kind of started. I was a younger monastic, and Ajahn Brahm bought this, uh, bu uh, built this huge retreat center called Jana Grove, and some of you have probably been there. And in the beginning, it was like uh, any other uh, retreat center, and I don't know exactly how it started, but somebody brought a teddy bear. It was Nicholas. It was, oh, yeah, okay. He gave that Ajahn a stuffed tiger. <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of Ajahn Brahm's kind of close uh, friends or disciple or something who brought a teddy bear. And Ajahn Brahm, uh, he, he probably just picked it up 
and trying to make something inspirational out of that as well. Because that's what he's doing. Whatever he, he's trying to use any means of inspiring people, making people happy and glad, and learning them to meditate, and so they can get their spiritual training going. And and he he uh, he, he kind of uh, used this teddy bear, and um, after a while, more and more people came with new teddy bears, and he, he started to kind of. In the end, he uh, uh, there were so many teddy bears that he he basically said, okay, everybody just come and take a teddy bear, and you can take it back to your room, and keep it in your lap. In the beginning, it was kind of. Uh, he didn't want to do this in public because it's a bit strange thing to do. You come into a retreat center and there are 50 people sit with a teddy bear. <laughs> it's kind of an unusual thing to see. <laughs> so, so, uh, in the beginning, he told them, just take out teddy bear and go back to your room and sit in your room with a teddy bear in your lap. And then, because the thing is that if, uh, if we have had some kind of a toy, a teddy bear, or whatever is kind of teddy you've had when you were a kid. It has something to it when you're little, like when you're two years, three years, five years, five, something like that. And you take, you, you find this friend, and you, you keep it in your bed. And you have this friend you can sleep with, and you feel safe and comfy, and, all, and life is good as a little <laughs> kid. And that kind of stays with you. So when you, as a grown-up, get a teddy bear and hold it, there is a chance for those beautiful feelings can arise in you. So the same feeling of happiness and peace and <laughs> like that can re-arise in you. And that starts this process we have been trying to teach this week about this joy, this, this pitisuka, this happiness. It starts this kindling of something <coughs> mentally, mental pleasure which makes it fun to meditate and makes you meditate for a long time. And you can learn to kind of grow that joy uh, and, and um, later on use that to the wisdom. <laughs> so it's coming from Ajahn Brahm in Perth. And we're bringing it's that It's spreading. Us. They're multiplying. <laughs> yeah. They're not keeping their footsteps. <laughs> Yeah, you still have to be kind to it. Yeah. <laughs> mm. This morning, this is great, I'm getting questions about Ajahn Ralph. I mean, it's great in the sense that uh, it's quite ironic, really, because he should answer them. Um, this morning, Ajahn Ram spoke about our attitude towards our meditation object. The object is not important, but our attitude or relation. But if we have any knowledge or awareness of our attitude... Hasn't it become another mental object? Exactly. Changing our attitude equals huh? criticizing this now object? Hmm. No, because it hasn't become another mental object yet. At the moment, it really is a genuine attitude and relationship of kindness towards whatever's there. The key here is you don't be kind and make peace with something so that it goes away. You're not coming from a place of criticism or aversion. You're just doing it because it's a beautiful thing to do. That's very important because if we actually think, right, I'll be kind to this so that it changes and become peaceful, that's like doing a deal. And the mind's very tricky. It, it easily starts to create these deals and then it's not unconditional anymore. So the really important thing is to genuinely be so peaceful and I don't know if you said it in that talk or another talk, that even if this doesn't change ever, even if you never get your breath, even if this anger stays forever, you love yourself, you love this anger anyway, you love your mind anyway. I think it was in this talk, he says, not even hoping that it will change, not even expecting that one day you'll get past restlessness, this is how many times I've listened to that talk. <laughs> um, you don't even hope or expect or imagine that you'll get beyond whatever's there now. So it's really unconditional. But the result of that is that the object does change into your attitude. Because if you're watching something with love, the object becomes lovable. 
it kind of takes on the quality of the mind. The object doesn't really exist as this or that, right? Like a human being doesn't exist as a good person or a bad person. That's completely fabricated, to use that word. That is the value we give to a person, right? That's the way we look at them. The very same person you live with, if you wake up in a bad mood, you'll look at them and think, oh, they just never get dressed properly, they don't tidy up after themselves, like I'm really fed up, all they ever do is this, this, this. And you see all their faults, right? You see the same person when you're full of loving kindness or you've had a really nice day. You say, oh, you know, I know I was too critical before. They've got so many good qualities. I remember why I married them in the first place. And, you know, they can maybe do nothing wrong if you're really in a good mood. So that it's not in the object, it's in the way you look at it. And after you look at it with a lot of love, I mean, we've seen this in the way parents bring up children, if the mother or father or both, or both mothers or fathers, whatever the parents are, look at that child and give them love and continually listen to them and are generous to them, then that child starts to kind of respond with all this love and all this affection, right? So in that sense, our mental objects also change. And there's another talk by Ajahn Brahm. I'm giving away all the very, very best, best talks. It's called Wise Ways of Watching, and I think it's now on the Deeper Dhamma podcast of the BSWA. Wise Ways of Watching. It's amazing, and it talks about six different ways you can watch anything. Um, basically kindness, generosity, valuing, contentment, love, etc. And he's basically saying that the object, beco- the attitude becomes your object. So if you keep on making peace, you start experiencing peace as your object. And we can check that out. You know, if you, if you have loving kindness towards the aches and pains in your body and you really give them space, you know, you like expand your awareness, you imagine they're just being hugged by this beautiful, friendly mind, they start to really soften. They, they actually change. So this is kind of what it means. It doesn't mean we observe them that way so that they, so that they change. Yeah? Suppose robots uh, robots could do all the productive work, so nobody needs a job. <laughs> Would your ideal world then be a planet-sized monastery, <laughs> where everyone just meditates until we are all permanently blink out of existence in Nirvana? <laughs> It actually would have been nice if we could be use technology and stretch it so far that we basically don't need to do a lot of work. I don't think it's going to happen though, but that is actually a nice thought. Um, but I honestly, I think that um, uh, it's not going to happen. <laughs> basically, um, To, to kind of start full on our spiritual training uh, it's far from everybody who are basically willing to do that it's quite few who uh, who, who do it today and um, can I add something to that And also the other question about living in one's own virtual bubble. I would ask, why do we want to do that? Why would we want to do that? And how do we think we could actually mature? You know, if we actually had just only people living in a monastery, one of the important parts of our practice is to develop gratitude to the people who support us and have that reciprocity. I don't think it would work. I don't think we could do it just in isolation from one another. And I think that's why the Buddha created a Sangha. You know, that, and made certain rules that we couldn't grow our own food, for example. We had to have contact with people. If we wouldn't, then we wouldn't develop the compassion. I feel like it would be very, very limited. It would be institutionalism gone mad. And uh, <laughs> I think we would lose, basically, our humanity. So I don't think the path would work. Even, even at the time of the Buddha, 
like, like probably the best teacher, like, like which has been on this planet the last millions of years or something. He, um, they he existed in a, a, a society which was quite peaceful. It was they didn't have any uh, kind of YouTube or <laughs> TVs or internet. Probably lived a quite a, a peaceful life. They probably had a lot of work to do, but they didn't have much disturbances. And even in a kind of a little bit of an ideal society for spiritual practices, and having such an enormous great teacher, he still just managed to uh, involve a limited amount of people. I think he managed to get to about 1,000, 1,200 people all the way in his life and, and quite many more who get to the third level or second level or first level. And he probably had quite many like, followers who were just doing this to a certain degree. But there were much, much, much more people there who, who wasn't interested or they were interested in something else. I, I just, I can't see this happening. That is it's just getting the main purpose of all the living beings on this, this planet. But we can keep it running so that those who wish to have the opportunity. Mm. And people can take their time. Since we are aiming to return to emptiness, are we? Are we emptiness, experiencing itself as something for eons before returning back to itself? Um, <laughs> well, since we are aiming... The thing is, um, we're not aiming to return to emptiness as Buddhists, because there's no return. The Buddha said that there's no return as in there's nothing there in the first place, right? But as I said the other day, there's no such thing as emptiness. It's not a state, it's not a place. And the Buddha said that, you know, everything basically that we understand as existence starts from delusion, not from emptiness, from delusion. And delusion cannot be traced back to a first cause. So he never said that everything started with emptiness or that that's what we have to go back to. And what he did mean by emptiness is that we... the the process that we think is a self is empty of anything substantial, anything essential, and anything that's going to be permanent, permanently happy, right? So it's empty of something. It's not that there is this thing called emptiness. So are we emptiness experiencing self? We are not emptiness. If we, are, if we identify with anything, even the most refined states, then we're still deluded. We're still deluded. And it can be, I mean, of course we want to identify with something as long as there's a sense of self. And so if we are experiencing refined states of mind, it will be natural to think, wonderful, now I am just pure light, now I am just pure love. But that's not the right way to understand it, or now I am the emptiness. Emptiness is your experience. It may be the object, or, or some kind of state that you want to call emptiness, right? Because we can put all kinds of words to these things. But as long as we're identifying with anything as being who we are, then we're still not seeing its true nature. So, um, are we emptiness experiencing itself as something for eons? Hopefully not. That would be terrible if it went on for eons before returning back to itself. So, not exactly. We're trying to end suffering. We're trying to see that this whole um, existence, what we take to be ourself, is actually a causal process. It arises from causes and it ceases when those causes are removed. And so if we can put in place some of the more beautiful causes, then the result will be increasingly more beautiful. But eventually that beautiful mind that we can create in meditation by putting certain causes in place also has to be um, understood as impermanent and non-self. And it's when we understand that, that even the mind itself will, um, will basically cease. And that's when Nibbana happens. And as we've already said a few times, there's no worries there at all, because it's an increasingly blissful process. 
And these things will only happen according to nature, when nature is ready for them, when the mind is ready for them. And it's probably not going to happen for a very long time for most of us. So don't worry about that. And I think it's really important not to have these concepts or ideas of what we're going to discover along the path. Um, because that can already frame our experience in ways that is not based on wisdom necessarily. It's important to read the Buddha's teachings to be informed of um, right view to a certain extent, but really to keep an open mind and to just understand that whatever you think it is right now, you haven't seen the full truth. So keep exploring, keep going deeper and keep um, asking open questions, not questions that start with a an assumption in any way. Even the question that's used in Thai forest tradition quite often, who am I, is a question with an assumption that we are something. So Ajahn Brahm has, uh, it's, it's a kind of, yeah, it's a loaded question. It's a question with a cert, that predisposes a certain answer. So Ajahn Brahm's question is, what do I take myself to be? So we're actually trying to dig at where we're getting stuck and how we're identifying in ways that cause us suffering. So if you do have any questions, then keep them very open and be like a kind of, I don't know, I don't know about a theoretical physicist, some kind of physicist that has a hypothesis but that is seeking to prove it, right? Right or wrong, with an open mind, so, yeah. Yeah, and I can probably add that what I like to do, I like basically what the Buddha said, is this, this we're going for something, and we call it for nirvana. And the Buddha called that for the highest happiness. That is something which is kind of easy for everybody to understand. It's the high, according to this Buddhist teaching, it's the highest. And it's something we are supposed to experience ourselves. And until we have experienced it, it's kind of, kind of, it, 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 it will just end up with a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions. And, and it doesn't have that much meaning. Just know that there are something up there which are by many people you know, described as something of highest happiness. And then uh, do the training, learn and experience and find that wisdom yourself. And maybe you can find out if it's true or not. And I think you will find it's true. How would you like a uh, technolo um, <laughs> technological <laughs> shortcut <laughs> to enlightenment? It's a lot of happiness now. <laughs> How would you like a technological shortcut to enlightenment? Maybe you can have one of these. And it can be an like enlightenment button. You press there, and then bang, you get enlightened. That, I like that. Um, <laughs> Like some sort of brain stimulation device that can launch forward straight into the jhanas. I like that. Yeah. I think, is someone getting impatient? <laughs> <laughs> Would you be pro or contra apple <laughs> apple eye <I> somebody? <laughs> Hmm, I think somebody is using his mobile phone a bit too much. <laughs> um, There's quite a lot of questions, I do. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, uh, I think techno technology, uh, all the technology available, it can help to distribute good teachings. I don't think it can do that much more than that. I don't think techno technology can, in the future, it will take a long, long, long time before technology can kind of do something with our mind, be connected to our mind. I think that's like science fiction ideas which exist, but maybe, I don't know, a million years. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so it will really... in, in internet, when you have your Facebook and everything, you always get what you want. So the one that made all this, they made it like the we got the, how do you say it, um, we get pleasure of uh, getting certain things. Mm -hmm. So they can kind of change us to where they want us to go. 
Without us. But that's got nothing to do with enlightenment. That's no, no, the that's happiness. Yeah. That's craving. Yeah. 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 But it's actually keeping us hooked. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's no shortcuts. Basically, these questions yeah. might be coming from impatience with the process. And if you skip the process, you don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. This is about wisdom. Yeah. It's not just about happiness. <laughs> But still, the happiness of wisdom <laughs> is the deepest happiness. But still, I like a John on device. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be impressed, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, question on relating to one's thoughts. If we, uh, mm, we've got a lot of questions here and not much time. It'd be nice to finish a few left. more. I just, yeah, like to honor the questions. Um, I guess we'll have to have another retreat. Or maybe we just stay. Since no one's enlightened yet, we could just <laughs> continue. All right, I think no one's enlightened. I might be wrong about that. Question relating to one's thoughts. In his encounter, if we encounter a negative thought, should we stop it or... Uh, something to, or change it to a positive one which will make it less likely for the thought to uh, reoccur possibly mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it really will make it less likely for the thought to reoccur that is one way of practice and it's a useful way um, to overcome thinking right there and then. It's called substitution, so that's the replacement of a negative thought for a positive one. However, most negative thoughts tend to fade when you stop giving them so much interest and you don't make a problem out of them. So probably, depending on your meditation and how frequent these thoughts are, if you are trying to let go and, and basically incline to the peace in the mind, it's probably preferable to just let them be there but not give them much intention. And that's a method called ignoring the thought. And usually, it's actually a method listed by the Buddha called ignoring the thought. Usually when you're meditating, that can be enough for at least them to fade away and not sort of take up the center of your mental screen, if you like. But if it's a kind of repetitive thought and it's obviously kind of related to a mood, say a mood of aversion or fear and it just keeps coming and you see that you're getting in this groove that's really unwholesome and it's just taking you down, then it might be helpful. It becomes more of a hindrance then, so it might be helpful to apply an antidote. So then a negative thought, depending what it is, can be replaced with loving kindness or it could be replaced with compassion for yourself or for another person. Um, and that can be very helpful. Of course, actually using thoughts of loving kindness can be a method in and of itself where the thought becomes like your main mental object and over time a feeling will arise uh, related to that thought which is actually a, a feeling of loving kindness. And it's very similar to the bliss that arises through breath meditation which arises because the mind's getting clear of hindrances. But it also has a special quality. I mean, it has the same quality of you know, the cause of being increasingly free from hindrances, but it also has this warmth and this sort of softness and tenderness that you can kind of relate to love and kindness. It has a slightly different flavour, um, which is very expansive, very beautiful, uh, very soft. So that can be also a skillful way. Um, and really it's similar to the question I think yesterday, of knowing when to practice in an active way with right effort and when to be more passive. And that really is uh, something you can experiment with. I would say generally to perhaps start with more um, active effort, if you like, like actively bringing up wholesome states like we do with metta in the beginning or with the reflections on one's own goodness, one's own generosity, or feeling like you're in a safe space or adding imagery to the breath, etc., and then gradually um, let that go if you feel that your mind is on the right track. It's like we're trying to condition our mind to do less and less, but we have to put it on the right track first. So um, I hope that is something that can help. Any more? It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Past nine. Someone had got their hand up. I don't want to... 
was was it still oh, yeah. relevant? Could the, we just? This was just a question regarding the the talk. Can it be emailed to the participants? Yeah. This morning's talk. Oh, can the question the, the, be sent? The MP, the MP3 file. Well, you you wish a copy of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, no problem. Uh, just talk to me afterwards, and I can send it to you. I think everyone might. Yeah, yeah. and also yeah. we will uh, most uh, normally after a retreat we send we make this uh, like letter to everybody, where we just attach a link to all kind of files and stuff we're talking about, which books we've been talking about and what talks etc. So all of, all of that we will kind of put into a file and send to everybody, a few days after this retreat. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Have a nice evening.